You know, with the Pentium well established by the mid-1990s, you might think the 486 was pretty much dead and buried. But, well, couldn't be farther from the truth, it was thriving. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and we're going to have a look at a Cyrix 586 machine. Not the most in-depth look, to be honest, there's so many things that we could just go off on tangents about, we'd be here for a long, long time, but, well, I'll... Get on to that more as we go along. So here we go. Let's uh, roll the intro and have a look at this damn thing. This is another locally sourced case that looks like ones we had at my workplace. Again, it's not from there, so some other company must have gotten their systems from the same place we did. At one time, this chassis would have housed the 33 MHz 386 SX machine, but that was long gone by the time I got it. All that said, the case isn't very fancy, which is fine by me, though it is one of those that paints even its insides, and I always find that a bit strange. Just leave the zinc coat, there's no real need to... I guess maybe they didn't have zinc coat. Two-digit turbo display. It's always the debate, isn't it? Do we set it to the FSB speeds, like 33 and... Well, I guess it'd be like 16 by default, but it, you can play with it. Uh, or do you have it say high and low? It was already set to like 33 in this chassis, so I just left it alone, because, you know, it seemed appropriate. And then you have this whole problem, where you've got like a 386 era case that has like a 3... Digit seven segment one where you'd feel like it was wasting it. I don't even know what to put in this. Let's take the lid off it anyway. So starting at the top of the cards, we have an S3 Vision from Diamond. By the time I film this, I'll probably only have one meg of RAM installed, but it can take two. Some people claim the Vision cards were faster than the later Trio cards, but I find this claim to be dubious. Because as far as I know, no major changes were made, and the Trio was just a more integrated version of the Vision chips, maybe with some extra AVI acceleration slapped on or something. Then again, that didn't come until the Trio 64V. Some may cite the older VRAM versions as being faster, but again, I find this claim dubious, because whilst VRAM was once faster than standard DRAM, if only because it was dual-ported, this advantage starts to go away once EDO RAM became available and Trio cards use EDO. This Vision also uses EDO, so it is a DRAM version. Speed's a subject we're going to come back to at the end of this video, given it's a diamond card, and I've decided to finally start testing something I've long theorised. Next, there's a network card. I never have much to say about these. It's a network card. It does network things. The BNC connector is missing on this one for some reason, I seem to think I borrowed it for something else, and it doesn't really matter because I own 10 of this same card and don't really use 10 base 2 very often because the whole network will go down. Here's a creative MP400 MPEG decoder card. It decodes MPEG-1 video and audio. My scenic is better. Weirdly, this card needs both the internal feature connector and the external VGA pass-through cable. You can't run it with just one. It won't work. You need both. I've never used another card that does it this way. It's usually one or the other. So, yeah, I don't really know what they were going for. The design of this card is a bit crap, really, because it has the age-old annoyance of no internal audio headers. Like, why even bother having orgs inputs on sound cards if nothing was ever going to use them? Some sound cards don't have them? Well, sure, but then you could do what the MVP 1100 did and have a CD pass through internally. On the back of the card there are audio jacks there, but they're both outputs. One at line level, the other amplified for speakers. Yeah, great, now I have to waste the line in on my sound card, so good luck if you wanted to plug something else into that. Why not make one of these other jacks an input? That way I could pass another line level source through to the sound card, or pass my sound card's output through the MPEG card. I mean, my Turtle Beach Maui can do this. Dicks. Why miss the- I don't get why everybody fucked this up. I I'm really not joking. Why did so many peripherals keep doing this? You can probably thank this for the bullshit we have now, where everything just stuffs its audio signal through the expansion slot and then cars a bunch of latency. Because now that's just the norm, and it's shite! 
The next card doesn't have that problem because it doesn't do audio. This is a creative RT300 video capture card, but calling it a video capture card has been rather generous. You'll notice it doesn't use a feature connector or an external pass-through lead. Instead, it uses the Intel i750 CPU and stuffs everything down the IS Airbus, which, as we discussed in the WinTV Celebrity video, sure does have some major limitations on it. The i750 alleviates these a little bit, but not really enough, and the card honestly makes me think of those parallel capture dongles, but in IS Air form. Don't expect to watch movies on it. I at least think this was a much cheaper card than the Win TV Celebrity, and it had bloody better have been, because if it was in the same price range, and given it came out a few years later, it was a bit of a rip-off, to be honest, and really, they were starting to make cheaper capture cards by now. I, I don't know, this thing would have to be priced very low to justify its existence, and to be honest, I'm not really very impressed by it. Beneath this is a creative or 32 value... Value? Well, that's open to debate, isn't it? Especially with today's prices for this bloody thing. The short version of the story is that this card is just a Sound Blaster 16 with a wavetable from EMU stuck to it. Props to Creative because they did at least have a PC speaker pass through on their cards. No Orgs header though, but that's no excuse for the implementation of their MPEG cards when the MVP 1100 just leaches the CD audio. But anyway, this card uses a technology called CQM. This is a Creative Labs design, and it replaces the Yamaha FM chip. Some people really, really hate it. Some people really, really like it. I personally don't mind it. Whilst it isn't entirely accurate, it is interesting to think that in some cases, this might actually make it more accurate than a genuine FM chip. I once talked to Lee Jackson, and he seemed to think that Duke Nukem 3D's FM timbers were tweaked to sound right on an all card, which would mean they were really intended for CQM and not Yamaha FM. Therefore, they sound as intended on CQM, if this is true. And the same would stand for any game from the point the ore cards came out onwards and that we might never know about. Plenty of them might be meant to sound right on CQM and not FM. It's an interesting thought nonetheless, and personally I'd just say if, if it works, then use it. If you don't like it, then find another card. It's, it isn't a big deal to me. Curiously, this sound card was part of a multimedia kit with a CD-ROM drive, the very one in this system. Hmm, BVB? I wonder if that's a forerunner to DVD, but, like, not quite as capable, like, barely versatile bends or something. I don't know. Barley video bandwidth. <laughs> oh, no, this is like, uh, what? A, at least a quad speed drive? I don't think it's an eight speed. So, yeah, we should be able to do like eight VCDs at once. This thing should be fairly capable, right? Oddly, it is a Panasonic drive, as was common for creative and multimedia kits, but it uses an IDE interface. The sound card doesn't have IDE, it has MKE, so the drive can't be used with it. Notably, this particular kit was sold to an OEM, that bin Orchid, to be used in a Pentium machine that these parts came out of, so perhaps the OEM got to choose this when ordering the kit, as many motherboards had a secondary IDE channel by then, and, well, that one did. Our motherboard today has such a feature, this is an ECS um 10 paio it's a Socket 3 motherboard, and it uses UMC's Triple Eight chipset, just like the PC Cheap's M919, the Bio Toilet 8433, the Shittle HOT 433, and many others, including the Aquarius 4 Dump. Oh, sorry, that's DUPM in my Pentium Overkill system. These chipsets are excellent, and they offer a good PCI implementation that actually works and doesn't require tons of jumpers only to not work anywhere, and they perform at a decent speed. They work with pretty much all CPUs, and, well, if they don't, then your board just isn't designed very well, or the bias sucks. The motherboard has a few aces up its sleeve compared to some of the others, because whilst it isn't a VIP board like the M919 or 4DUP, that is to say it doesn't have a VLB slot, it does have some other nifty features on it. For one thing, it actually supports EDO RAM. A lot of later 486 motherboards claim to do this, but didn't. Although, whilst it does work on this one, you don't gain any performance, and actually on the few boards it will work on, this is usually the case. It really just uses it like FPD RAM, it, it doesn't really take advantage of anything. 
The motherboard also has eight 32 pin dip sockets for cash instead of half assing it and only having four where the other four would be 28 pin crap. Most motherboards did this and it's annoying. This means you can install 512k of cash without having to fork out for the even harder to find 1024 SRAM chips. As usual, ECS get the little features right that nobody else bothered with, but get no credit for it. Either way, implementing it in this way is clearly possible, so I don't know why the other motherboards couldn't do this usually, but this one does, and it's very nice. You know, it makes me think, a lot of them claim to support one meg of cash. Did they even make chips that size, like, in the 32-pin, like, form? Because you would need, like, two fucking meg times... It I just, that, I've never seen anyone install it that way. You know, it's probably worth noting this board does use one of these bloody Dallas chips, but it is in a socket, and it's like right there, which is really easily accessible, so when that breaks, well, yeah, pretty easy to take it out, fix it, replace it, whatever. And I mean, it's not, you know, it is a negative, but I mean, the Biostar boards, they have them soldered between PCI slots. I can't guarantee all of these have them in a socket. They might have cut costs and got rid of the socket at some point, but... I mean, this board came out of a, a scrap lot, and also, to be honest, out of all the UMC AAA boards I've used, this probably is the best one. Uh, I can see why people like the other ones and why they chase after, like, the, the Biostar and stuff, I guess, but it, it might even be, like, a half faster if you're going for the benchmarks, that one, but... Yeah, this really is the, the best experience I've had with one. I mean, I like my Aquarius probably the most, but that thing's quirky. You, you really have to be know what you're getting into with that. Before someone asks, it does have vias for a PS2 header. Like, that would be on the end of a wire, like the serial ports. They're not popular. I don't know if they would work. Haven't tried. Not really interested in doing that, but... Well, now you know, if you, you know, you wanted to. Also... I don't believe it has a game port on board, but I, I don't think anyone uses them anyway. Some of them did. The Aquarius has one. But, yeah, it was a 486. You're going to install a sound card anyway, let's be honest. CPU support on this board is excellent, especially if you have the little voltage regulator module. Without that, you're going to be stuck on 5 volts, so, yeah. You know, you could probably make one. It's not particularly complicated, but well, it depends if you want to do that or not, I guess. If you can find one, then you just use that. It's worth noting that this motherboard uses a CMD0640 PCI IDE controller for its primary IDE channel. These had a design flaw that could corrupt hard drives, although now it hardly matters, as this system isn't going to be doing anything mission critical, and there are ways around it. In plain DOS, there's a patch you can install, if you can find it, or else you can plug the hard drive into the second channel, which is just plain ISA IDE, Alternatively, you can just use Windows 95, which silently patches the bug, though it impacts performance a little bit. It, you could also just ignore the problem, it really is up to you. This motherboard's late enough that the system probably shipped with Windows 95 to begin with. I mean, this motherboard was made a good way into 1995, and they might well have been producing them until 97. I have, I have 486 motherboards from 1997. I, I doubt the issue ever came up on the system it was in. Because, yeah, it, it really is quite a late motherboard as far as consumer 486s go. It, it has plug and play, for heaven's sake. So it really was pushing into the post-486 era. It's probably worth note that if you have one of these and do worry about the uh, CMD0640, you can actually disable it on this motherboard. It has a jumper for it, so... Yeah, that'll get you IRQ14 back, I guess, and then you can use a PCI card or something if you want, but really, like I said, not worth worrying about in a system this speed and this time period. You might as well just run Windows 95 and, yeah, the performance hit don't matter. And it really doesn't matter in this one because I don't have a proper hard drive, so we're using flash memory, which is quicker and you just don't notice. Even on ISA, one of those is going to be really quicker than any hard drive that this thing would likely have had, so it, it just doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, if you're worried about it, you can turn it off. Obviously, the system has a Cyrix 586 chip. I know I've put screw marks in this, but I, I must have eight of these damn things. This CPU is essentially a scaled-down Cyrix 686, 
but that wasn't ready for release yet. When it did, though, the 686 was the fastest CPU for a little while, so, well, this thing should be pretty good. I mean, it's a, an M1 core. Uh, well, yeah, it's the Cyrix M1. As usual for Cyrix's CPUs, there exist IBM and SGS branded ones, as Cyrix didn't have their own fabrication facilities. I've never seen a Texas Instruments branded 586. I'm not sure if they exist. I'm leaning towards they don't, but, well, I didn't think there were SGS branded 686s for the longest time, and, well, there are, so... Well, there could be TI 586s, I don't know. I don't think there is. Prove me wrong. If you have a picture of one, I'd like to see it. The branding doesn't really matter anywhere. They are operationally identical when running as intended. Variants exist at 133 and 120 megahertz, but these are extremely hard to find. I'll actually give you a couple of hints if you're into that kind of thing. The 120 megahertz model is probably faster, especially if your motherboard has decent bias that lets you play with dividers and timings because it has the faster FSB. The 100 MHz models will often overclock to that speed, and IBM seem to have had stricter quality control, so... Well, those might offer you a more stable overclock if you have one of those. Interestingly, 100 MHz models will often also operate in 2 times mode, where you can run them on a 50 MHz FSB at 2 times multiplier to get 100 MHz. I've never played with this, so I don't know how well it would work. But I'd expect most motherboards would just force the PCI to half speed, so you'd actually lose performance rather than gain it. But hey, it might be a fun experiment if you have a, a VLB board that's capable of 3 volts and want to live life dangerously. Of course, if you just want things to work, then I'd always recommend just building a, a, an actual Pentium instead. Pentium systems, especially... You know, from early Socket 7 motherboards onwards, even the ones that are really just Socket 5, are really much easier to work with and there's less faffing around, but yeah, you know, it's, it's up to you. And obviously I can totally see the appeal of uh, these these kinds of things, these 486s that are not even really 486s anymore, just barely. And farther to that end, the Cyrix chip wasn't alone. It competed with the AMD 586, which, unlike the Cyrix with its fancy new 5th generation core, was just a beefed up 486 core, and Intel's Pentium Overdrive, which was actually a Pentium core. In fact, it was a P54 and not an original P5. Now, how do these CPUs compare? Well, that is a whole kettle of cod, and I'll touch upon that at the end, even though the last time I touched up anything, I got a rather hard slap in the face. Still, incidentally, running your AMD 586 at 120MHz is often faster than running it at 133, so there's something to keep in mind for those of us who don't like to overclock very much. I mean, you're running at a lower total clock speed than it's rated for, right? It's underclocking. Anyway, these Cyrix CPUs were probably a little rushed, so they have some quacks and some motherboards don't like them. But then some motherboards don't like the Pentium Overdrive, and I've had some that run inexplicably slow with AMD chips too. There are also features on the Cyrix CPU that are disabled by default, which I won't be using, but we'll talk about it a bit at the end. Anyway, I think that covers the hardware, so, well, what do we get if we want to use this machine? The BIOS is quite sophisticated for a 486 motherboard. It also seems the write-back cache options actually work instead of doing nothing. I mean, that's if you want write-back. Sometimes it's better to use write-through, especially if you want to install a lot of RAM, because then you, otherwise you'd have to buy more cache. And performance is interesting. Meanwhile, the system runs Windows 95, and it seems to work fine. We can run Hover anywhere, which is good, because it's not really a real Windows 95 computer if it doesn't do that. The Oars Wavetable doesn't even sound too bad in this game, to be honest. In some cases, the Oars Wavetable can be made to sound really, really good, but usually you have to write music specifically aimed at it to work at its best, and oftentimes, otherwise, playing general MIDI, it can sound actually a bit crap. I mean, this would all be fine if it wasn't supposed to be a general MIDI device, so I don't know, a bit of a mixed bag. These cards do tend to just work like the Sound Blaster 16s did, only maybe not quite as well. So I really don't mind them as far as that goes. Yeah, I hate creative, but 
I don't really have any gripes with this card other than the usual, uh, it's a Creative Labs card and it's not really built that well and it's noisy. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it does its job. I wouldn't want to pay the prices people ask for them now. You know, I, did, I didn't pay that for this one. Like, <laughs> I wouldn't earn it if, if, if like, I had to pay that much. Like, people are silly. We can run Duke Nukem 3D pretty well on this system, though. It actually really isn't bad, and I'd say we did manage to reach the boundaries of Pentium performance with this machine. And I'll tell you a little trick with uh, games like Duke Nukem 3D. If you can run 8-bit audio mixing, then do that, because it really does help the frame rate. You can't really hear much of a difference. I, I mean, the, the sound files are all 8-bit anyway. So it's, it's only really the mixing that, that is improving, and a lot of the time you don't really notice that much when the game's going on, especially if the music's on. Now, the, the main gimmick of these late 486 systems is that they were substantially cheaper than a real Pentium, which is a great idea because consumers were starting to buy PCs a bit more by that time, and this lower cost was very, very attractive to them, especially as many of them probably didn't even know the difference between Pentium and Pentium Class when the salesman started fucking harassing them in the middle of the shop. Oh, I forgot to mention, this board comes from an OEM box. It shows a high screen logo before the first screen. I'd hope it was in a desktop chassis, otherwise this would be a lie, as well on a desktop chassis, the screen would have sat on top of the case, making it a high screen versus it just sitting on the desk, which would make it a low screen, and presumably there would have been a lawsuit. But then I haven't heard of this OEM been around anymore, so maybe they did that and got sued into oblivion for false advertising. Now the MPEG card, it, it works, but it's fucking region locked, just like Creative's later MPEG-2 cards were. I don't really understand why they did this, and it's pretty stupid. You can actually play NTSC videos on it, but they'll play slow. Yeah, this card's PAL only. In fact, both it and the capture card were sourced locally, so small wonder that they're PAL, but... All my other ones are not region locked, like... The, the Scenic can play both, and... My SIS card can play both, and... My ATI can play both. Uh, you know the VGA pass-through on this thing makes a regular image quite a bit dimmer, more so on my screen than what you're gonna see. But then an MPEG video looks oversaturated, so yeah, problems at both ends of the scale, and it's pretty rough. It seems about right for a creative product, it's their kind of build quality, and it does do what it claims to do, as long as you're only trying to play a PAL video on it. Uh, I guess it's fine. Certainly the sort of lower quality gimmick I'd expect as an option in the system at this price range if you had the money to spend but didn't want to uh, buy an expensive system. You know, it would have just been the, the OEM cashing in on the multimedia trend of the time. Oh, see, I don't mind it, but my, my Scenic MX2 beats the ever-living crap out of it. It does work with Media Player, at least you don't need proprietary software, so how's that going for it? It really isn't terrible, but it could be a lot better. The capture card didn't come with any software, so if it ever had any, which it more than likely did, that's lost to history for now. I do have Ulead Media Studio though, so we can use it, and uh, yeah, it's about what I figured. It's not as bad as I expected actually, but it's obviously slow and the quality isn't very good. They do at least have quite a few inputs on the card though, so well that's kinda nice. However, the, the parallel dongles usually had pass-through, so yeah, if you were going to make this kind of thing, maybe you could have put that on, but... Yeah, I guess you can't ask for everything. I mean, if we can't have bloody audio headers, then I, I guess that's asking a bit much to have video pass-through. That would be just pushing our luck too bloody far. Yeah, I guess it's just a gimmick card that serves as a gimmick, but I, I think I'll stick to my WinTV celebrity. It is possible you might get slightly better results out of this card with a faster CPU, but I doubt it and suspect the IS Airbus is holding things up the most. I'm surprised it's even this smooth as far as frame rate goes already. I, I really doubt the i750 is that much of a powerhouse, but yeah, I'll stick to my WinTVs and AI techs, because this thing is just... I wouldn't want to use this as an editing PC, you know? So, how are we doing in benchmarks, I guess is the question now. Well, it's really not bad at all, to be honest. 
thrown in with an AMD X5 and Pentium Overdrive as well as my Pentium 66. It does hold its own and the system tread places a few times. It's a little bit of back and forth. No, they're unlike my usual tests. The other Socket 3 chips aren't in the same system or the same configuration. So we're really comparing different systems with vastly different settings more than comparing CPUs here. And I do have my reasons for this, and I'm going to talk about it shortly. Anyway, the systems trade places, and yeah, if we did even more tests, it'd keep happening. The motherboard timings are actually quite slow by default here, so we could certainly gain quite a bit more speed in the benchmarks, but I'm not really too interested in that. Also, my Pentium 66 is faster than one running on the more common Intel 430 Mercury motherboards. It probably is far to say that all these Socket 3 CPUs do reach Pentium level performance on average. There is a problem though, one which I cannot ignore, but I think I'll leave that to the dickhead in front of the camera to go and talk about it, because I just want to go and have a sandwich or something now. Well, there we go. Benchmarks actually do come off a little underwhelming in places, but there's a couple of reasons for that. Well, there's actually a few. For one thing, I, you know I like to show things as if the average consumer just got it out the box when it was new, and the default timings on this motherboard are actually quite slow. We can adjust them because the bias is really good. If it's set up exactly the same as my Aquarius, it gets pretty much the exact same score. Which figures, because it runs on the same chipset. So, you know, I, I guess you'd get the same results with the, the Biostar or the PC chips or the Shuttle one. Oh, whatever one people are more into. This kind of changed. People used to be really into the Biostar, and then they were really into the the Shuttle one. Uh, yes, I don't know, you know. If, you know, and then I think people were into the PC chips one. So, yeah, you, you have... They're probably more common, the PC chips. The, the Bio Toilet and the Shuttle one are, are by far the more common boards than this ECS. I don't see too many of these, and if they're missing that voltage regulator, then I guess you'd have to make one. Uh, I don't know. But they, they all perform about the same. So, yeah, we can fiddle with timings. Also, this Cyrix CPUs, they have a bunch of features that were turned off. I, don't, I guess they figured they weren't ready yet. You can turn them back on as a utility, and if you look around on the internet, you know, there's uh, forum posts about it, like which settings to use for best results. I think CPU Galaxy did a video about it, and that guy knows his stuff, so you could always look that up. And there's people who've blogged about it and all kinds of things, so you can totally find this information. I'm not really interested in doing that personally, I've messed with it in the past, and the, it, it always seems to cause one issue or another. You can get around those, but we'll just leave it as it is. Other thing, this fucking video card. I've, I'm sure I've mentioned before that I think diamond video cards are slow. I've, I've often said, like, this uh, performance, you know, isn't lining up here. And if I've not said it in videos, I've certainly yelled at people on Discord and in real life and basically anyone who listened. I was, the, the performance isn't adding up. And I'm kind of sick of that, and I actually have the card right here. I, I changed it because I have another card on that same chipset, but it doesn't work properly. Because 9 megs a second for Visa memory, whether we had the extra meg in or not, the most I could push, I could push a little more, but it, it, I think maybe we just barely broke in double figures. We should be double figures comfortably, because on trios you get that. And the thing with trio cards, I still don't think there's any major difference between the two. The trio's probably got more features for like AVI acceleration or something, but really I think the only difference is the integration's not there and that RAM deck's still external. It, th this is the same chipset, it's the same 868 as the Diamond. 19 megs a second, so now the numbers go up. A decent amount and things are smoother than they were on this spear one and i tested other things uh trio 64's same deal you know swap a diamond for a, an expert color this works better i have one that's not brand at all comes out pretty much the same numbers as this and the diamonds are slowest to the pack the video 2001 and my pentium 66 
I know it's fucking slower than other Trio 64 V pluses. I actually have an expert color one I got. I didn't choose to find them, but I, I seem to have more expert color PCI cards than any of the others. But yeah, I, I know that's slower than it should be, but that system's fast for a Pentium 66, just a little. And this leads us into that whole thing of how I was like, oh, we're not running the same configuration for these systems. Because really, I can't say one of these Socket 3 CPUs is better. Uh, real thing is, with the Pentium, a big part of what's making that faster is its chipset. Most Socket 4 Pentiums seem to have Intel Mercury chipsets. Mine has a SIS 5500, which is quite uncommon on Socket 4 boards. Not that Socket 4 boards are particularly wide, but it's really a Socket 5 chipset. That system fully supports Socket 5 CPUs if you can get them in there, which we've talked about doing in the past. It's fully capable of doing that. Um, and that chipset's a lot better than Intel's Mercury one. And what we're going into now, this does carry over into like Pentium era motherboards and even farther. But it's quite pronounced on the 486 platform, where most of the t I think all of the tests we had here are actually on UMC boards. But if we go and get a SIS board like an MSI MS4144, and we plug these same CPUs in, even use the same peripherals, they'll start swapping places because that SIS chipset performs better with a different CPU. And then if we go and pull my ALI motherboard out and we stick them in there with the same peripherals and swap places again, if we go and get my Opti, which is VLB, it'll change again. If we go and get my Intel 420ZX motherboard and try again, assuming it will work with all of these, and the results will be crap because Intel's 486 motherboards are fucking horrible. Um, and I don't have a VIA one. I don't think the results will be that great because VIA weren't there yet. VIA's chipsets got good later, and a lot of people hate them. I think they're blaming VIA for the board, mate. You buy a shit late 90s MSI motherboard, and there's VIA chipsets. It's like, no, you, you bought an MSI motherboard. They were all crap. It doesn't matter what, what chipset was on it. <laughs> Those celery MSI boards were nothing but trouble. I think there's your problem. I, I don't have problems with uh, later VIA chipsets. Their 486 ones uh, can, can be a bit arsy. And so I, I don't know. And I, I honestly think this is something we need to come back and test, which is what I meant about this whole, whole kettle of bloody cakes or whatever you mess that up. But <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a whole fucking headache unto itself. And making the charts for that would be a headache too. I, doesn't really matter. I, maybe when I have a little bit of money to burn, I'll try and find a VIA motherboard. The Opti, I'm probably not going to try and find a PCI. We know VLB's a little bit quick, but because we have UMC boards, we can probably dial it in and figure out what the offset is and get a rough idea. I mean, it, it does do 3 volts, that board. It's not very reliable, so it's going to crash on me a lot, but we'll, we'll be able to get the numbers out of it. Because it, it, it's kind of weird how, how that happens like i don't think it's favoritism by the designers i just think it's the way things work and certain cpus work better with certain chipsets I, yeah, did i have anything else to say no i already talked about register enhancements didn't i the, the things you can turn on on the cyrix chip so yeah it's you know like obviously you can tweak things uh, around uh, the, the whole 120 megahertz thing, it's, you know, it makes you wonder, I, I'd like to go and, I should go and look at the prices, because I, I wonder if the 16K DX4120 that AMD made, they did make one. I wonder if those were cheaper than the X5, because if they were, then, <laughs> then people buying X5s probably got screwed a little bit there. If you, they're very hard to find, the dx 4 120, they have a 16k cache version, it's... It makes me wonder if those were more available and cheaper back then, I might have actually been a better CPU. It's quite noticeable, like, if you have an AMD X5, try it, so get it at 120 megahertz, and if your motherboard will let you run your PCI at 40 and it'll work, or if it's on a VLB board, it'll go a lot faster than it will at 133, like, you know, it's not like you're going to get double the frame rate, but you will actually notice just a little increase. It's, uh, it's kind of surprising that not so many people are running them in that configuration. 
and uh, it's I don't know. I guess it's it's not what the the manufacturer spec, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I'm surprised less less people. Are, I mean, I guess you can reverse them at one sixty, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, anyways, yeah, but this machine it, it was it's another parts machine that they were taking up room. You, you always have spars when you've been in this hobby for fucking years. And uh, we slapped it together. I don't mind it. It's not my favourite. It's not my least favourite. It'll go in the rotation. Probably show up in a stream eventually, because they all seem to. Usually just whatever I have set up at the time. It's usually woefully underpowered. It's usually a fucking system requirements. So who needs us? I'm fucking... Why is it running so bad? <laughs> it's off for another day. Obviously, capture cards are working. I had to use workarounds to use them, but they're good. Got them going, the SD card broke, so I couldn't film anything. Sod's fucking law. Hopefully everything holds up. I don't know. Probably fucking not know my luck. Um, so yeah, I guess that's it. I'm High Treason. Thanks for watching, and remember until next time, there'll be a screw up, load DOS 622 up. Although maybe not in this case, because I mean, we're on a CMD 0640 and the hard drive might get corrupted. But that adds to the thrill. I mean, it's like in that suicide Linux thing everyone was using. Like, Jesus Christ, that was, that was <laughs> over 10 years ago. <laughs> I think I'm going to go and like cry myself in, in a corner or something. I, well, yeah, anyways. <laughs> I suppose I'd better start looking for cheap via motherboards for a rainy day.